Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. It is with this assurance of hope that we come here today to worship our God and to give thanks for the life of General Samuel Vaughn Wilson, a beloved son, brother, soldier, husband, and father. He was a man who lived the life given him by God, sharing God's gifts and God's love with his family, his brothers and sisters in Christ, and his community, and indeed, an entire country. It is in that same spirit that we come to celebrate, to give thanks, and to bear witness to the perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Blessed and holy God, we come this day blessing you for all the, your saints who have kept the faith, finished their race, and who rest from their labor. We thank you for this day and for the opportunity to gather in fellowship and worship, for the opportunity to worship your holy name and to gather as a community of faith to give you thanks and to be consoled in this difficult time. Especially now we come thanking you for General Sam, a beloved member of our family of faith and your own child whom you now have received into your presence, who taught so much more with his life than we could learn in the sh very short time we have had together. This day we come asking for minds to remember all that he taught us, even as we struggle with the separation. Help us to believe where we have not seen, trusting you to lead us through our years, and bring us at last with Sam and all the saints into the joy of your home. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now as we remain standing, as we are able, let us sing together our opening hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God Almighty. You can be found on page 138 in the blue hymnals and page number 11 in the red hymnals.
Welcome to this memorial service honoring the life and work of Sam Wilson, the college's 22nd president. Having only joined this community a year ago, all of you knew Sam much better than I. But from the conversations I enjoyed with Sam, I was always struck by his passionate belief in the transforming power of Hampton City education and the importance and the continuing relevance of this college's mission to form good men and good citizens, a mission we have been pursuing continuously since it was penned by the college's first president in 1775. In addition to college president, Sam played many other roles during his long life. He was a soldier and a military hero, a public servant, a husband and father, friend, mentor, and above all, a teacher. In all these roles, Sam's life exemplified the great quote, what we have done for ourselves alone dies with us. What we have done for others and the world remains and is immortal. This was a theme in every conversation I had with Sam, that our work must be about others and not ourselves. Our work must be about bringing out the talent and full potential of every individual. Our work must involve building up, not tearing down. Our work must be to advance the common good. In every conversation, Sam reminded me that we have here at Hampton Sydney, the Wilson Center for Leadership in the Public Interest. And Sam's focus on others in the world is why so many of you are gathered here today to acknowledge that Sam's life and his work live on in us and in the way we live our lives and through our own work. To Susie and the Wilson family, the Hampton Sydney College community extends a special greeting. The loss of a husband, father, or close relative can be a time of unspeakable grief. We hope you feel a special embrace of love and warmth from all who gather here today. Today's reading is from Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign power, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of lives, babes, and infants you have felt in a war because of your foes silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that are mindful of them, mortals if you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with your glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, and the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all of earth. Samuel Vaughn Wilson, Lieutenant General, retired U.S. Army, warrior, diplomat, professor, mentor, musician, actor, college president, Sunday school teacher, advisor, counselor, father, husband, friend, and most of all, true patriot. You know, the story of uh, Sam Wilson is so incredible that uh, many who didn't know him will honestly wonder if this is someone who was created in Hollywood by a novelist. You know, Sam had a long and distinguished career. It began in 1940, when on a Saturday night he heard Winston Churchill's famous We Shall Never Surrender speech. As many of you know, he ran the seven miles to the National Guard Armory to enlist in the Virginia National Guard fudging on his age just a little bit by two years to be precise. He was only 16 years old. After completing uh, OCS and the training for the Office of Strategic Services uh, in Fort Benning, Georgia, General Sam was recruited by the 5307th Com 
composite unit, better known as Barrow's Marauders, fighting in the China Burma India theater as a young lieutenant. <clears throat> fighting behind the Japanese lines, General Sam earned a distinguished service cross, the nation's second highest award for valor, for his actions as a reconnaissance platoon leader. According to General Sam's own story, which he relayed to me, while operating in the jungles of Burma, one evening he and his radio operator were surfing channels on a high frequency radio. They found a station that was coming in clear, and as General Sam sat and listened to it, he didn't understand the language, and he pondered aloud the question of what language is this? His radio operator informed him that it was Russian. As the son of Russian immigrants, the young sergeant began to translate what was being said. That event, according to what General Sam told me, was the moment at which he made the decision that when the war was over, that he would go and become an expert on the culture, the language, and the history of this country called Russia, and these people called Russians. Uh, in 1947, that quest began as he entered Foreign Area Specialist Training Program at Columbia University. He learned Russian. He was practically a native speaker. After graduate school, he spent three and a half years in Europe and various places, developing his skills as a foreign area officer and a Russian expert, as well as a case officer and an agent of espionage working in multiple locations in Europe. 1951, General Sam took an assignment in Washington working for the Secretary of Defense and doing some special intel projects until 1955. After going through the CIA case officer course, General Sam began running clandestine operations against the Soviet Union from West Berlin. In 1964, he was seconded to the U.S. State Department with the personal rank of minister where he served in Vietnam until 1967, whereupon he returned to active military duty as the commander of the 6th Special Forces Group. During his time at Fort Bragg, General Sam helped develop Special Forces Doctrine as the Assistant Commandant of the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School. In 1970, General Sam received his first star and became the Assistant Division Commander of the 82nd Airborne Division. And a little known fact is that he actually was the interim commander for a period of time of that distinguished division. He was also the first general officer to serve as the attache in Moscow. He was, uh, during that period, it's a little known fact that he also did, in fact, uh, act as the CIA station chief for a period of time when the station chief was declared persona non grata by the, by the Russians. Because of his experience in intelligence operations as well as uh, combat operations, General Sam was selected by then DIA, CIA Director George H.W. Bush to be his Deputy Director of Central Intelligence for the Intelligence Community. General Sam's last assignment as the military was as the Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Upon leaving the military, General Sam stayed very active by becoming a mentor to the newly formed Delta Force. For many of us in here today, first met General Sam, the great warrior. After Operation Eagle Claw in 1980 in April, which was the failed rescue attempt of the 52 Americans in Tehran, General Sam became part of a review group called the Holloway Board. They were designed to study that operation and make recommendations for the future. The end result of the study was recommendations for a new command structure and multiple new units. From that study came the Joint Special Operations Command as well as SEAL Team 6 and myriad other special operations elements. General Sam's most enduring <coughs> contribution, both in service and out of service, was probably the role that he played in the development of the Non-Cohen Act which created the United States Special Operations Command. I believe we have the deputy commander here today. When that legislation was bogged down and they could not move forward because of opposition from within the military, but also with members of Congress, Congressman Dan Daniel, which some of you will remember, called General Sam back into action, sent him to Washington, and because of his wisdom, his foresight, and his incredible diplomacy, he broke it loose and ultimately 
shepherded through the writing of that legislation, which gave us the Special Operations Command, which particularly after 9-11 has been an incredible blessing to this country. Closing. I will say General Sam, who I know is looking down today, the motto of our special forces, which is De Oppresso Liber, to free the oppressed. Old soldier, you're free now, as you sit at the right hand. How do you speak about this larger than life man whose passing has made grown men weep? No words will ever do his extraordinary life justice, but I will try. I had the rare fortune to work with General Sam during his presidency at Hampton Sydney College. He became president during a very unsettled time at the college. The junior class enrolled then had seen three different presidents in their three years. In fact, that had provoked the printing of a very popular bumper sticker there that said, honk if you've been a Hampton Sydney president. <laughs> Fortunately, then, the trustees had the great good sense to eschew the traditional forms of searching for a college president, which obviously had not worked very well for us, and went in search of General Sam Wilson. And they found him at his farm in a field behind a plow. He delighted in telling the story that he saw a big four-door sedan drive up that day, stop a suited man get out and walk across the field to him. The chairman of our board said one sentence, Sam, we need you as president of Hampton City College. Sam said that he didn't have to think twice about the offer. He accepted it and always said that as far as he knew, that plow was still in the field where he left it. <laughs> We realized we had the perfect man for the job from the moment he addressed us in the early summer of 1992. The college community had gathered in Crawley Forum to hear the announcement and the new president's remarks, whose keynote statement was, the most important person walking this campus today is the student. From that moment on, he devoted his time, his talents, and his advice to our students and the rest of us as well. Finally, stability came to Hamden Sydney College. He became our rock, and that defined his presidency. General Sam was, in every way, a servant leader. He was indefatigable. No task was beyond him, no person beneath him. For us in admissions, he did everything but make us coffee in the morning. And it wasn't just the help he gave us, but the quality of the help. He was the best rip and brenner, speech giver, storyteller, and motivator of all, and always in that humble manner of his. One father at an open house once came up to me and said, you know, a nice gentleman welcomed us when we arrived on campus and told us that he worked at the college. <laughs> Come to find out, he's the president. <laughs> Sam had an incredible partner in his presidency, too, and our dear Miss Susie. Oh, Susie, the care you gave to him and to us and all the meals and the delicacies you made. Every Sunday night during the second semester, Sam entertained our prospective honor scholars at Middleport with his stories of Hamden Sydney, where he delighted in legendary tales like the virtues of the class of 1791, referring to William Henry Harrison as a Hamden Sydney dropout, 
<laughs> Often throwing in Samisms like Adam's all fox or wheels on their heels and rockets in their pockets. And each one of those special evenings was topped off with Miss Susie's pies. I will also never forget one of the parents' weekends when Sam and Susie invited the students and the parents who had attended college church to come to Middleport for lunch. Sam was on the porch greeting people, and I was in the yard, noting that far more people were coming to lunch than had been in church that day. <laughs> Sam kept looking at me, and I kept saying, they're still coming, Sam. And he was shaking his head in that little shake he had. And after lunch was over, and yes, Miss Susie had fed everyone beautifully, Sam said to me in that pure Southside Virginia accent, Nita, this is a modern day version of the parable of the loaves and the fishes. <laughs> Sam and Susie never knew who they might find on their downstairs sofa in the morning. <coughs> Sam once told the story of being awakened by piano music at 2 a.m. He went downstairs and saw a student sitting at their piano just playing away. He said, I just went on back to bed. <laughs> the power that General Hand Sam had because of his stature was no more evident than in the luminaries he assembled for a symposium held at Hamden, Sydney in 1993. The Vietnam Symposium Voices of the War 20 years after has never been eclipsed in excellence here or probably anywhere. From Senators McCarthy and McGovern to newsman Morley Safer, film producer Oliver Stone to General William Westmoreland, Hamden Sydney was the center of regional, state, and national news. When General Westmoreland, who had made few appearances since his retirement, emerged from Middleport before his session, he was surrounded by the news media, who fired question after question at him. Did you come to give your final views of your command of the U.S. forces during the war? Did you come to explain the casualties in the Tet Offensive? He listened to the barrage, and the question stopped when he began to speak. I came, he said, because General Wilson asked me to come. General Sam was still highly visible after he retired from the presidency. He was our rock again on that fateful day of September the 11th, 2001. As disbelief surrounded us, it was General Sam who led a jam-packed session of students, faculty, and staff in John's auditorium to discuss the act of terrorism. The general then gave an inspiring message about the strength of our country, the blessing of America, and the honor of patriotism. We remember General Sam's speech of ten notches on the walking stick punctuated by the overarching advice of his mother, do right, Sammy, just do right. We remember the order to his students in his classes to put your pencils down, which led them to know that they were in for some great stories. <laughs> we remember his St. Crispin's Day monologue from Henry V, tailored to the Randolph-Macon football game. <laughs> We remember his description of Tony Shaver's basketball team as being tough as woodpecker's lips. <laughs> we remember the time he took with anyone who needed advice or a kind word or just a shoulder to lean on. It is hard to imagine the thousands of hours he spent on his porch with hundreds of people one at a time. And especially we remember his great faith in guiding his soul. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. I will end with a personal note. 
21 years ago, General Sam gave a much younger me the opportunity to be the first woman member of the President's Cabinet and in Sydney as Dean of Admissions when many doubted that the job could be done by a woman. General, I hope I've done you proud. Deeply honored and humbled to have the opportunity to speak at General Wilson's memorial service today, and especially to represent my 10,000 brother alumni. Alumni of every generation absolutely adored our President General Sam. The Richmond Times Dispatch wrote a beautiful editorial about General Sam and his legacy of patriotism last Friday. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to go over this afternoon and Google it because it's a fantastic read. The final paragraphs of that editorial set the basis for my remembrances of Sam here this afternoon. The editorialist writes about Sam's interaction through the years with its staff at Richmond Times. They write, and I quote, We rejoiced that the country could produce paragons such as he, yet worried that his virtues had been trampled by lesser boards. His person shone from the hill. Fewer comprehend the source of his light. Ladies and gentlemen, much has been said about Sam's military career and his impact on the college. But I want to talk with you about the source of his light. That light is the bedrock that anchored the Sam Wilson that we all love and admire. The source of General Sam's light was his unashamedly bold and strong Christian faith. It's how he lived that faith that gave him the character that we'll forever remember. Sam saw his role as the leader of Hampton Sydney to be much more than the normal leadership tasks given to a president. Sure, his leadership improved morale, it built the endow rebuilt the endowment, and rebuilt the confidence that many people had lost in the college. But Sam took on a new role, perhaps one that had been unembraced by Hampton Sydney presidents, perhaps since the 19th century. He carved a role as the spiritual leader of his campus. And Sam, we students saw a quiet and a humble servant. A man who was more at ease in the daily lives of his students than he was in the boardroom. And a man who deeply cared about every individual Hampton City family. We saw him serve, we saw his compassion, and we saw his gentleness. Indeed, Sam emulated that source of his light in all that he did. But General Sam was not alone in living this great example to this campus. Susie was his perfect companion, and she too led with grace 
and humility. While my wife Tammy and I were dating in the early 1990s, we were among the first groups of students that would come to Sam's Sunday School class, that he would teach right over there against the back wall of the sanctuary every Sunday morning. Those of you who have heard about the Sunday School class that Sam would do knew that if you attended Sunday School, you had an open invitation in the middle court every Sunday afternoon where you would feast on Susie's Sunday lunch that she had been working all morning to prepare. The two of them knew that the quickest pass to the hearts of young men and their dates were through the extra generous helpings of ham, roast beef, gosh, I'm getting hungry thinking about this right now, <laughs> mashed potatoes, and a sizable portion of, and I quote, Susie's fat pills with butter. <laughs> That's what Sam sweetly recalled called her biscuits. Her pies were the literal icing on the cake. Together, they fed the bodies, and perhaps more importantly, the souls, of students who desperately needed both. <laughs> For those of us who participated in these weekly gatherings, we witnessed humility and kindness at its deepest level. In the company of a man and a woman who had traveled the world, who had served our country at the highest levels of service, and who had been in the company of some of the most influential people of the 20th century, a ragtag bunch of young students were every bit as important as presidents and generals, diplomats, or corporate leaders. You felt that way also if you took one of Sam's classes or had lunch with him in the Commons. Susie, I want you to know that those of us who learned from the example that you and Sam set, we carry it forward today. Often when Tammy and I are entertaining students, alumni, or parents at our home, we try to make them feel part of the family. And we frequently ask ourselves, how would Susie and General Sam do it? And I'll add, I've even seen our new president scramble eggs and the board chairman do the dishes. <laughs> that editorial writer from the Times Dispatch knew that General Wilson embodied those verses from Matthew chapter 5 about being the light on the hill and letting your light shine so that others can see your good works and glorify our Father in heaven. As we live this place today, and carry forward that memory. Let us do so by remembering the same fruits of the Spirit that General Sam so deftly showed to us all. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those traits are General Wilson's legacy to us. Let's all do our best to live up this day. Thank you. Susie, Gwen, William, thank you. Your love, care, and support of my father added rich years of achievement. General Tobo, it is fit and, fit and right to honor passing comrade, but to come all the way from Fort Bragg is more than gracious. To citizens and other soldiers, esteemed and ordinary like myself, know that you provided an authentic providence which engaged my father with civility, courtesy, and mutual respect. Thank you for being here. And now, O oh Lord, may these own words be a blessing. In the waning days of my father's last campaign, I sat and talked with him several times. His mind was clear, though his body fatigued. The pedestrian orbit of my life had infrequently crossed that great arc of his public service. And I had taken a privileged seat with many of you to watch and listen and learn. 
but now I drew near. As I drove down from New Jersey, I wondered what conversational topics would ease his last journey. I found that he was eager to reflect on shared professional interests, specifically World War II Burma and Vietnam. You well know the formative elements that shaped my father's life, a deep Christian faith, a strong moral imperative to do right, and the lessons of an early life on a family farm. And I would add also a divine gift of imagination and creativity. Yet, I think we must go back to 1944 in Burma to find the moment that gave impetus and direction to his amazing life. On the last campaign to take Michinon, where the Japanese operated a fighter base, my father's men were sick, exhausted, and hungry. They stopped in a village of native tribesmen hostile to Japanese soldiers. They willingly gave what they had to the famished marauders. The platoon then left the village with full stomachs and gratitude. Hardly had the unit cleared the village outskirts when an American fighter plane roared in at treetop level, strafing the village and sweeping on away. <clears throat> Huts caught fire, livestock were slaughtered, casualties and dead lay everywhere. Running back into the village, my father encountered the village chief who stood holding the remains of his young daughter in his arms. He looked into my father's eyes with shock and grief, wordlessly asking, why, why? My father was 20 years old then, the normative age of a college junior. For the next 73 years, he remembered that moment. In fact, his voice broke with a muffled sob and his eyes reddened red when he told that story at Sailor's Creek at a rocking chair seminar just five years ago. I believe this tragedy was the critical moral moment of his professional life in or out of uniform. His became an earnest quest to find the least destructive ways to the most positive outcomes. Thereby, he came to embrace the conservative principle of war known as economy of force, to put the fewest at risk and danger to accomplish the mission, and he would add, to protect the non-combatant. When he wrote the U.S. Army's Doctrine for Special Forces, the ethos of his work was summed up in the Green Beret motto, De oppresso liber, to free the oppressed. His lineage goes back to Isaiah 1, 17, relieve the oppressed. St. Augustine, centuries later, wrote, the turbulent have to be corrected, the oppressed to be liberated. In World War II, the OSS in Europe had adopted this motto. To my father, however, it was a distillate of our Declaration of Independence. De oppresso liber requires putting oneself in another's shoes linguistically, culturally, socially, and psychologically. It mandates giving assistance to beleaguered people with unusual military skill, ingenuity, bravery, and respect. Colonel Sam merged the economy of force and de presso lever in the mid-60s in Vietnam. After serving as Ambassador Lodge's mission coordinator at the Saigon Embassy, he got permission to try an experiment in the middle of an escalating war. He assembled representatives of the Department of State 
the agency for international development and other non-military agencies, integrating them with specialized military units, civic action, psychological operations teams, and a modicum of security forces. For four months, he prepared, trained, and focused them, drawing in Vietnamese military and civilian leadership to take ownership. He rightly dubbed his mission, Operation Take a Chance. In March 1967, he led his unconventional, multicultural, and interdisciplinary force to free the province of Long An, the gateway to one of the major rice bowls of the world. The result? An uncontested liberation of heavily populated areas in Long An without firing a shot. Today, we call this exercise soft power. Back home, a besieged president would carry in his inside suit pocket the memo about Operation Take a Chance. It was found years later by an archivist at his library. It had been unfolded and refolded many times. Faith, ethical values, economy of force, de oppresso liber. My father worked nearly eight decades to exorcise the ghosts of North Burma. He used idealism, hard work, teamwork, and creative leadership. His unique career has been respectfully chronicled in the media. His legacy is now anchored in history. This man who earned his letters on the campus of the world has stepped into the passing ranks of the greatest generation. Yet I suspect that in the quiet, hopeful morning hours on these grounds, as you walk to Settle Hall for breakfast, or to early class, or to work. He, with a respectful nod to the fallen Spartans at Thermopylae, that economy of force that saved the idea of democracy for the future millennium, in his soft southern brogue, just might call out to you. Go tell my country men of Hampton, Sydney, and citizens passing by, that here, ever faithful to her sacred values, my spirit lies. De oppresso, Lieber, General Sam. Goodbye, Dad. General Sam's third reading comes from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, Sam, good luck. When General Sam, when General Sam uh, consulted with me several weeks ago about what he wanted, 
included in this service. These three particular scripture readings, which others have read here, were very important to him. Psalm 8 was his favorite psalm. The Beatitudes were an expression in uh, context uh, Jesus of the essential teachings of Jesus here on earth. And General Sam remembered them as teaching uh, things to be held in honor. And most especially, he wanted uh, these last words that John just read because this is the promise that he said he was facing in the coming days, the promise of eternity. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118, verse 24. Those were always the first words that General Sam spoke from the stage when he was presiding over each of the college commencements where he was present. Those words, before any word of public welcome, before asking me to offer the invitation and before a single reference to Mother's Day, which is always at the Sydney's commencement day. Our major academic celebration through this man began with a quotation from a Hebrew hymn. Many of us were privileged to know this man as someone who often spoke and who certainly exemplified faith words and moral sensitivities that flow as naturally from his heart, his mind, and his voice as did the life breaths that this great man rhythmically inhaled and exhaled for 93 years and 252 days. General Sam's inauguration as the 22nd president of our nation's 10th oldest college was held on Saturday evening, February the 6th, 1993, followed by a buffet dinner and inaugural dance. But the next morning, President Sam taught his student Sunday school class <coughs> Standing over here, a lady wasn't always back there. It was more often where former presidents Josiah Bunting and Chris Howard were sitting today. He taught that class dutifully the day after his inauguration, even though that inauguration had followed in close sequence after the exhausting Board of Trustees gathering that had barreled forward from Thursday evening until past Saturday midnight. General Sam incidentally told me just a couple of weeks ago that he always insisted that those students who came to his Sunday school class uh, would stay for worship here and then go to uh, Sunday dinner at Middle Court. General Sam said, uh, Father Willie, that's what he called me, uh, Father Willie, I consider the worship service at College Church to be a bridge between my Sunday school class and dinner, and I'm sorry for all the boys who jumped off the bridge early. <laughs> Susie and Sam and I met there in the birthplace 
by candlelight at his request for what he wanted to be an unheralded devotional service in that symbolic room, something that he and I recall several weeks ago in our conversation about today's service. When we were leaving the birthplace that evening, he thanked me, and I replied with what I thought was an amazing calendar congruence that just then occurred to me. I said something like, we should both thank God, General Sam, because I just realized that this was the very same day, February the 3rd, 218 years ago, when our college founders held the last of their three-day meetings in this room. General Sam, however, topped my brainwave with his own astounding response to me. All right. Nathaniel Venable, who was present there as the owner of that building, was either my fourth or fifth great grandfather. <laughs> I tell you, in that moment, uh, I think I must surely have had goosebumps on my arms as I sensed that the kaleidoscopic particles of the voices that had been sounded within that wooden all those wooden walls, as well as the flat passing decades, had suddenly come to cluster again in the shimmering presence of this amazing man who was about to become our 22nd president. I knew then, friends, that this college was going to move forward with a personal, almost cosmic force that was dimensionally far, far beyond the vote of the Board of Trustees. In due time, we heard others of his family stories that showed this man's moral compass was not entirely his own, but also attributable to family values that had quietly been passed down from generation to generation. For instance, consider the great moral stand that General Sam's great-grandmother, Lucy Lockett Vaughan, took during the years following the Civil War when she taught the Vaughan's African-American Lieutenant Orleans' bright son, Robert Russo Moten, to read. A singular action of both justice and compassion that was contrary to the prevailing Caucasian norms of that day. That young reader, taught by General Sam's great grandmother, would grow up, of course, to become president of Tuskegee Institute and to become one of the speakers at the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. For someone to have absorbed those kind of moral family values from his childhood made it natural that in his retirement years following his presidency here, General Sam chaired yet another educational board. During the critical time leading to the development of Farmville's R.R. Moton Museum, which has now become Virginia's premier educational museum about civil rights in public education. Six years ago, I wrote a book entitled Bad Friday, April the 7th, 1865, which described the two United States cavalry incursions onto this campus two days before Appomattox, and the overnight campus occupation of a combined United States Infantry and Artillery Corps. Yes, United States Cavalry Generals Philip Sheridan and George Custer passed and trashed their way through here, 
followed by the overnight presence of a magnificent Army Infantry Brigadier General Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who camped over near the present day campus flagpole. Quite understandably, I dedicated this book to General Sam. I began the dedicatory page with a sentence from the Old Testament apocryphal book, Ecclesiasticus. That's not the canonical book, Ecclesiastes, but the apocryphal book, Ecclesiasticus. This quotation was the same sonorous sentence that introduced the Chariots of Fire movie about the British track team of the 1924 Olympics. I quoted that sentence which read, all of these were honored in their generations and were the glory of their times. That's the way many members of the Hampton Sydney family will always remember General Sam. Honored in his generation and the glory of his times. I concluded the dedication page indicating that while those 19th century United States generals made their brief business trips through these parts, their presence was now largely forgotten. But then I wrote how this other United States Lieutenant General of the late 20th century began his commuting business trips from the farm here for six years as a professor before establishing his residential location here for eight years as president, concluding that, I'm quoting, unlike those 19th century generals, this man would leave unforgotten marks because his memories are forever engraved upon our hearts. Now friends, this is the gospel truth, and you had better believe it. And I ask you, as you are able to stand and let us sing together this hymn, which in honor of the Lord God who gave us this man, a man who loved our country, this college, this county, and all of us.
occurred with the reading of the Special Forces Prayer, the playing of the Ballad of the Green Beret, the presentation of the flag to the family, a 21-gun salute. It is loud, even though it's outside. Don't jump. The sounding of taps and the playing of Amazing Grace. The family will depart at the end of Amazing Grace and looks forward to greeting you at Snyder Hall. After the family departs, the ushers will come forward to release each pew, beginning with the front rows and moving back. And all are welcome to come forward as their row is released to render honors or last respects to here at the front and exit through the doors to the front of the sanctuary prior to joining others for a time of fellowship. And now, brothers and sisters, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remain with you today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Now, Lord, let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please remain standing for the Special Forces Prayer and the other sequence of this. Please listen as I read the Special Forces Prayer. Almighty God, who art the author of liberty and the champion of the oppressed, hear our prayer. We, the men of Special Forces, acknowledge our dependence upon thee in the preservation of human freedom. Go with us as we seek to defend the defenseless and to free the enslaved. May we ever remember that our nation, whose motto is, In God we trust, expects that we shall acquit ourselves with honor, that we may never bring shame upon our faith, our families, or our fellow men. Grant us wisdom from thy mind, courage from thine heart, strength from thine arm, and protection by thy hand. It is for thee that we do battle, and to thee belongs the victor's crown. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Fighting soldiers from the sky, fearless men who jump and die, men who mean just what they say, the brave men of the Green Beret, silver wings upon their chest, these are men. America's best 100 men will test today, but only three when the Green Beret trained to live off nature's land, trained in combat hand to hand, men who fight.
Hey, fire! 